Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Everyday Anarchism. This is a continuation of the series on David Graeber's debt. My guest today, I'll let him introduce himself in a second, but my introduction is he has gone down in history as one of the greatest critics of David Graeber's book, Debt, although I know, Henry, that that was was not your intention. But nevertheless, that is what happened, and we are here to talk about it today. Thank you for joining me. I'm happy to be here. All right, so can you tell us a bit about how you became the firestorm around the Crooked Timber Seminar on Debt and how it is all at least partially your fault. God help us indeed. Well, I don't think it is all <laughs> partially my fault, but it's a it's a long and complicated story, which is more or less uh, as it went. Uh, Chris Bertram, who is one of the bloggers at Crooked Timber, which is a collective lefty blog that uh, both of us were involved in, which has been going God, uh, since 2002, I think, uh, maybe 2001, 2002. Anyway, uh, Chris re- read uh, Debt, and he thought it was an absolutely fantastic book. So he suggested to Graeber that, uh, why don't we do a seminar around it? Uh, we had done a number of seminars around books in the past, uh, some of them social science books, some of them uh, science fiction books of one sort or another, or fantasy, where a kind of uh, a weird and eclectic group of people. And Graeber had said yes, and then... Uh, I gather from Chris, had uh, been, had had some somewhat truculent communications as to whether he was actually going to uh, go ahead and uh, do the seminar or not. But anyway, the seminar happened. A bunch of people, uh, academics, some at Crooked Timber, some people who we had gathered from elsewhere, went ahead and uh, wrote pieces responding to the book. And my piece was one that uh, really got uh, Graeber animated and angry. Uh, I more or less, and for the quick version of the post that I wrote, was I suggested that I thought that the initial part of the book I thought was very, very strong. Uh, There was a lot of discussion of Polanyi, uh, type ideas about the uh, about the uh, pre uh, modern economy, which I thought were very nicely done, and which I thought were very good for modern readers uh, uh, who weren't familiar with the kinds of arguments that people like Polanyi and Graeber's mentor uh, Marshall Salins have made about the ways in which these economies work. But the final chapter, which was about the stuff that I knew about and that I write about, I thought that the final chapter was uh, frankly bad. I was uh, pretty straightforward in my criticisms of it saying that I just thought that the uh, argument that Graeber made simply didn't work, simply didn't hold water, didn't have the evidence that it needed. And so Graeber responded in uh, some very frank and personally derogatory terms, suggesting that I was out to discredit him, suggesting that I was lying about what the book said. And so this whole uh, social media saga erupted with uh, grumpy, angry things being said in comment sections. Uh, Savage Minds, which was an anthropological blog, uh, sought to write something which was uh, uh, somewhat critical of me, as I recall. I would have to go back and look and find it, uh, which uh, said, you know, so more or less a Graeber's side of things, which was uh, probably better, but that there was something to be said for some of the criticisms, and uh, ended up with, I think, as I recall, Graeber effectively being told that he couldn't comment anymore because uh, things had gotten to uh, such a point of heat and rhetorical violence. So it was one of those kinds of spats that you get online with lots of people saying angry, harsh things about each other uh, uh, and nobody necessarily covering themselves uh, in a huge amount of glory. Without having been involved in it, that was uh, that's that's my perspective. I mean, that's that's more or less how I under how I understand it to have gone. I had not read your recent post. Uh, you know, Crooked Timber had an anniversary recently, and you wrote a post about it. But when I was talking to to Cory Doctorow, and I just briefly mentioned this legendary Crooked Timber, whatever. It was an internet argument. We all have been involved with them, I presume. I don't know if you can have such arguments on, on TikTok and Snapchat, but all of us at a certain age have been involved in this kind of of internet argument, they're 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 not good. They're not helpful. I'm go, go ahead if you if you want to weigh in at this point. Well, I think that's right, and I think that if you look at it here, so if I look look at the post and I reread the post, I think for the first time 
in about a decade uh, uh, in the lead up to the uh, Crooked Timber uh, 20th anniversary, uh, I certainly could have expressed myself way, way more diplomatically than I did. Uh, you know, so I think uh, I could have been uh, less dismissive of some of the things that Graeber said and that probably possibly, I won't say uh, probably, but possibly would have led to a somewhat more constructive conversation. Uh, but the other thing I would say is that you know, so I was not the only person who found himself or herself in this situation with Graeber. Uh, my sense of uh, him from what I know of his career is that he's somebody who was intensely loyal to his friends, uh, frequently kind to uh, younger people and to people who, uh, you know, sort of sometimes people who he had had, he didn't have any direct personal um, sort of self-interest in being kind to, but also somebody who was very, very uh, quick to take offense and very slow to forgive once offense had been taken. That is, uh, I did not have any personal interaction with him, but of course, through this podcast and, and before making this podcast, I knew plenty of people who did. And that's my that's my sense of him as well. The stories and anyone who goes to Crooked Timber, they can they can read the kind of uh, the kind of anger that he can unleash. It's all there in black and white, obviously. Also, the stories of his loyalty and kindness and willingness to go out of his way to help and support people are are just endless. You can't stop finding them. And that you know, I've never wanted this podcast to be about. Graber the person, but I I wouldn't have had you on if we weren't going to talk about this. And it does seem that those those two sides which you captured in your blog post are obviously they were obviously both there through throughout his career. And I can't say any more than that without having had a closer interaction with him. Yeah, well, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I will say. There are people, uh, and you know, so I don't get into anywhere near as many spats on the internet as I used to be uh, <laughs> used to do. Uh, you know, so this used to be. I, I think there's a PJ Wodehouse uh, uh, collection of short story called uh, "Young Men and Spats." You know, so spats. Mm -hmm. An item of clothing. Now I'm, a, I guess, a late middle-aged guy, and I, I don't get involved in spats anywhere near as much as I did. Uh, but uh, there are some people out there who I think are flaming assholes without reservation, uh, who I feel quite happy to have uh, sort of uh, to to have been. <laughs> Uh, combat with and utterly unrepentant, uh, although I would not probably want to get into fights in the same way. There are also some people who uh, I ended up I'm sort of having fairly unhappy personal relations with, who I felt were uh, not I'm sort of uh, malign or evil people. And Graeber, uh, I don't think uh, I would ever have particularly wanted to have met him because I'm not sure how that would have worked out. But I don't think of him as somebody who was a force for... Uh, I don't know, dishonesty or badness in the world. I have mixed feelings about some of his work, but that's all, as the original discussion indicated, but that's a different story. I want to get to those mixed feelings and the actual content of debt, but I do, I want to shed light uh, a little bit on his, his big objection to, I, th I think it was you and one other person, but there were a few, that, that two people that he principally mentioned, and we don't need to mention any other names, as people who he thought were out to discredit him. And I, and I do want to tell you, Henry, ever since I um, started flying under the flag of anarchism, which is, is less than three years now, I've had far, far more interest uh, in, in my, in my work than there ever, you know, when I was like, Oh, I work on progressive pragmatism and uh, democracy. People were not interested in that. People are interested in anarchism, but there has been a corresponding, disdain from certain circles you know certain people when they hear that you are an anarchist or work on anarchism they will not look at you they will not talk to you they will not read your work you must be wrong misguided not wrong and misguided i mean those things true you must be foolish silly and inconsequential on some fundamental level if you think that Kropotkin has anything interesting to say. And I can't speak for Graver, but having seen this, you know, in my very, very small career as an anarchist academic that is less than three years old, Graber must have been experiencing it for, for decades. And I can tell you it rankles. Uh, I, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. Okay. We can, we can, we can move on from that. Um, 
I, I want to talk about your recent post uh, about the book and your sort of reconsideration, but we can go first, I guess, to the, um, if you can remember back all that that long ago, the more than 4,000 days ago when you read and responded to debt. This episode is going to air, I think, uh, I'm going through the book month by month. It's going to air with chapter four, or chapter five, not with the not with the final chapter. But we can talk about, you know, your your big objections were to the final chapter. There's an economist named Michael Hudson who figures heavily in that final chapter and also in Graeber's work. And I can tell you that I do not care for the work of Michael Hudson and Michael Hudson's influence on the book, I think, is the weakest part of Graeber's debt. And it seems like that you and I probably agree on that. So I so I had, you know, and I, I guess you know, so as part of, as a result of the uh, fight, I ended up uh, reading uh, Hudson's Super Imperialism, uh, which is the book in question, in some detail. And uh, I guess uh, my feeling about the book is, on the one hand, there was a lot of stuff that I think set, set off alarm bells for me. Uh, that is, there was a uh, there you know there are descriptions of uh, of how it is that um, sort of his book influenced uh, I think Japanese policymakers to do this. How it is that I think the Nixon administration, if I remember, or some similarly weird group of people, uh, you know, sort of decided that they would take uh, some of his arguments and would use this as the uh, basis for major U.S. financial policy. And so there were things like that that sounded to me like uh, somebody who was uh, probably uh, you know, a super smart person who was involved in a whole bunch of debates, and uh, you know, so I, I being in, I, I work in DC, so I see the uh, outskirts of some of these debates. I was to some extent exaggerating the influence that he had. That said, the one that you know, so I would say there was a lot that I found that was fun and interesting in the book, and it was a cracking read. I mean, you know, yeah. so if, uh, you, uh, he he's somebody who can write, and uh, when you're writing about things which are incredibly tedious topics like um, sort of macro financial uh, politics. This is something that does not get the uh, heart racing of most ordinary people. You know, so being able to tell stories with verve and flair uh, means that I am personally prepared to forgive the person <laughs> quite a number of sins. So my, my take from reading the book was, uh, okay, this is probably somebody I would want to uh, double check everything that he had written to make sure that I'm um, sort of this was not being uh, spun out of control in pursuit of a good tale. Uh, perhaps you know, sort of, uh, and that, that uh, and perhaps I'm sure that may be going too far. Perhaps there, there's, but but I would also re I would also read and I would think, okay, this is somebody who has a clear perspective. Uh, it is a perspective which is not inherently a stupid perspective. Uh, equ uh, equally, it is a perspective I probably wouldn't agree with. But at the same time, and this was, I think, the uh, fundamental thing where I felt that Graeber was wrong is that uh, he misinterpreted, I think, what super imperialism was arguing as a book. I'm sort of crudely speaking, super imperialism, you know, it, it is a book like Graeber's book about the relationship between U.S. military power and uh, debt and financial relations. And uh, this goes back, there's a, there, you know, there is obviously a long, long history of such books that you can sort of refer to, um, sort of people like Hobson uh, back in the early 20th century, uh, uh, Lenin, a lot of people who are trying to figure out this particular relationship. But uh, the uh, super imperialism book, the argument was more or less that U.S. Uh, military power depended upon this uh, backstop of all of these uh, debt relations, financial relations, financial power, which the U.S. was able to use to um, sort of to uh, to effectively to provide the resources for its military, whereas Graeber's argument was more or less exactly the opposite of mm. that, which was that the U.S. military was really what explained U.S. financial power in the world. And uh, and so I kind of felt when I was reading Super Imperialism, and you know, so there, there really wasn't, uh, I think there were maybe one or two sentences, which if you read generously, could be read as being support for one smaller uh, aspect of Graeber's argument. But the source uh, that that he was relying on for this uh, big uh, part of his argument really didn't say as I read it on sort of what it was that he actually needed for this to be true. And so, uh, you know, sort of, and, and so uh, Graeber, as I recall in his, you know, and again, this is litigating uh, 20, 
you know, decades old spats on the internet and those sort of who said what and were they right and were they not right. As I remember, you know, sort of uh, Graeber said uh, that he had gone back to Hudson and Hudson had confirmed um, sort of yes, 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 this was awesome. Uh, but uh, my reading of what Hudson said, at least at that point in time for the text that Grable was uh, citing to, and maybe Hudson said different things in different texts that I hadn't read, was that he was uh, saying something which was more or less the opposite causal relationship. Yeah, a few things there. One, I I think that is essentially right in terms of, the, sorry, the bit where Graeber said, no, no, Hudson agrees with me is, I think, more or less correct, both in that Graeber said that and also in that Hudson said that. And I mean, after that was published, Hudson, I've seen some things where he more or less publicly backs yeah. Graeber's reading of super imperialism. Super imperialism is an interesting and well-written book, but there is a Precisely what you seem to have objected to in debt, which is a sort of uh, conspiracy mindedness about U.S. imperialism being a military first thing in order to, you know, bring in the money. I, I, I saw that in in Hudson's work. I miss I mistrust Hudson. I mean, I, I, someone I do not know and have not corresponded with at all. And perhaps I'm getting myself into uh, another fight on the internet by by saying this. But I'm, I'm I mistrust his reading of the world because it does seem to me to to smack of exactly the kind of grandiose and over exaggerated claims that that you mistrusted in in Graeber's work. And I think we just are going to. Have that well, different perspective on those two books. Go ahead. Well, so maybe maybe you know, so maybe the best way to uh, say this is to give you a sense of my instincts on the uh, on mm -hmm. politics, which is a you know, so empire is important. You know, so empire and imperial power is important. B it mixes together financial, military, coercive power in complicated ways. Uh, but C and here the C I think is crucially important. By and large, this does not. Uh, and you know, so maybe this is an anarchist insight, and I think some of the reasons why Graeber was annoyed at me was because I was suggesting that it wasn't, uh, you know, that, that in some ways this was a overdetermined argument, also that it wasn't a particularly anthropological argument. But I, I think, you know, sort of anthropologically or political science or whatever you want to say it, uh, these things do not arise as part of a grand universal master plan. Instead, these things arise through a bunch of frequently pretty self-interested actors acting together in ways that create these systems which emerge from their uh, emerge from their actions, but are not necessarily by any stretch of the imagination the product of conscious design. So if you look at empires more generally, you know, there's a famous and I think a rightly controversial statement that the British acquired their empire in a fit of absent-mindedness. Uh, that is wrong. I think that that's wrong. Yes, I think that it was not absent-minded. There were a lot of people who were very, very self-consciously and self interestedly going out there to try and expand empire, to try and build, uh, you know, so to build out uh, different pieces of the empire and then to ideally to get the uh, get the backing of the people back home. So whatever very uh, sort of lucrative little arrangement they had going was uh, supported by uh, the power of uh, Her Majesty's uh, Navy, etc., etc. So I think that there's a lot of self-conscious sort of effort that goes into building it, but it does not result in a plan and perfectly executed machine. And so I think that that is part of the problem. You know, for me, the problem with conspiratorial readings of history is not so much that they overemphasize the selfishness and the viciousness, uh, because you know, selfishness and viciousness uh, often, you know, so they go hand in hand with people looking to uh, seize and to uh, keep power, but that they overemphasize the amount of planning that happens. <laughs> and certainly, I'm sort of looking uh, at, and this is this gets on to uh, my own book with Abraham Newman, which tries to look at some of these uh, topics, but the uh, real conclusion that we came back with is that you get this vast, enormous system growing, uh, where the United States does have extraordinary power, 
over the global financial system. And Cory Doctorow, who you mentioned earlier, has this great piece, which I'm sort of which which sets out some of our arguments in a summarized form. But this does not uh, this do, does not come about because the United States is deliberately and consciously setting out to create a financial empire. Instead, it's because politicians are doing one thing and off- officials are doing another thing, and then another thing which builds on the first and which builds on the second, which builds on the third, so that eventually you get this vast imperial structure resulting from the whole, which is not in fact the product of anybody's conscious design, but instead results from uh, all of these different uh, architectures that people have built up in one way or another for specific and narrower purposes, which then provide the uh, kinds of foundations that uh, can then be built on earlier and earlier, uh, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger. One of the uh, reviews that we got, uh, which I found most annoying, was from the Financial Times, and they did correct one word in the review eventually, where they said that effectively the uh, United States had created this thing as the result of, quote, a vast and elaborate plot, whereas our <laughs> argument was exactly the opposite. Did you get this vast structure being created more or less because of the uh, individual decisions of individual officials and uh, never realizing quite what uh, is the big structure that they're making? So that is, that's the, that's the substance, I think, uh, getting back to your point of the disagreement that I have, which is that you really want to look at this in a, you know, so to get to a different anarchist in a James Scott kind of way, you know, so that mm-hmm. I think Scott is really, really strong in this stuff. He is some somebody who uh, talks about how you get these vast systems that are constructed, but these systems don't work very well. They are sort of, they are, they, they are um, sort of in many ways, they are incoherent. They are very often bad at doing the things that they are supposed to be do, uh, uh, good at. Uh, but uh, once they have come into being, it is extremely difficult to get rid of them. So first, I need to apologize. Podcasting host Misfire that I made you introduce your own new book. I should have mentioned it, and I promised I was going to next chance I got. So sorry about that. Secondly, I agree with everything you just said, and more or less how how you described the process of the building of the American Empire uh, and also the British Empire. And also, I, you know, I, as a hobby, I've taken up the Roman Empire, although I should make it clear to everyone that I have no specialized knowledge about the Roman Empire. It seems like a, like a similar thing. It, it seems to me that you and I and Graver, as far as I understand, more or less uh, agree on this. I did. I mean, I did just get myself in trouble. One of Graber's colleagues emailed me about something I said in a recent episode that the way I described Graber's position was the opposite, the precise opposite of his stated position. And that is that is absolutely true. I, I, I kind of joked that he was looking for an anarcho-communist utopia that came before civilization in both debt and the dawn of everything. And he states over and over again, in both of those books and elsewhere, that that's not what he's doing. And only idiots believe in an anarcho-communist utopia before civilization starts. I know, and yet it moves. And yet he's definitely looking for something that comes before civilization that is more anarchistic. I mean, maybe it's just the one of the first things I said when I first started working on Graeber's Debt is as I was going through the first chapter to kind of explain it for listeners to help people who hadn't read it to understand it and to guide people through it. I've done this for tons of texts uh, on this podcast, and this was the hardest one ever. My outline of like what Graeber is saying and what the argument is was longer than it was for entire books for a single chapter. His reasoning is 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 brilliant and his uh, evidence is far ranging and it's so far ranging and the brilliance of his reasoning is so chaotic that you you it it, it runs a risk of incoherence and then I think that also runs the risk of misunderstandings and clearly your process of discussing with him did not do anything to alleviate what might have been potential misunderstandings yeah well i i think that the disagreement uh you know and and i also think that there's a really interesting shadow history of economics that people could do, looking at the reaction to Polanyi and looking at how this is mediated through uh, the figure of Doug North. Uh, So Doug, who was a a Nobel Prize winning economist, he had this uh, very, very, very famous book on institutional theory. 
Uh, but if you look back, if you look back to the prehistory of where this book came from, uh, it, it, it originates from an article which is taking issue with Polanyi's account of history, and in particular, uh, Polanyi's account of how rationality and institutions tend to go together, and North trying to push back deliberately against that. So I think I think that Polanyi plays a much greater part in our intellectual history than people recognize. And the parts of death that I really enjoyed were the parts that tried to bring that to a broader audience, to try to bring that sense of how you can have different kinds of uh, social relations in which market relations can be embedded. And that you, know, and you don't have to think about this in terms of the utopian whatever, but it does expand your understanding of the possibilities of where things are at. But you know, so the uh, part of uh, the uh, book, which obviously I objected to, was the final chapter, because I just thought that this was, in a certain sense, this was a uh, him doing a reverse version of what he was criticizing economists for doing. So, you know, mm. more or less, he spends a lot of time more or less saying that economists, they come to the ancient economy and they already know, or they think they already know how this works. And so they construct this just so story, which takes this immensely complex set of social relations and reduces it down to a crude set of uh, demand supply relations in which uh, human beings are uh, rational calculators, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Graeber says that this is bullshit. And so my objection to the final chapter of the book was that he more or less does the same thing for uh, theories of international politics and the international economy, which is that he takes is immensely complex system and he comes along with a really simple theory which is uh, very explicitly and he kind of he tries to backpedal on this but uh, I think it is uh, very clearly what he says this theory which says that all of this power comes from the barrel of the gun and effectively that this all depends upon US military supremacy that the entire structure of debt which the world economy uh, revolves around depends upon the power of this particular state to uh, get things done to make threats etc etc Etc. Cetera, et cetera. And so uh, this seemed to me to be exactly the, the same kind of simplification where you take this complex system and you try to figure out uh, some simple explanation of how it all holds together. And so, and again, you know, so the, I, I probably stated this in ways that were maximally calculated to uh, outrage him. Uh, I, I thought that this was uh, him uh, calling the, uh, you know, the pot calling the kettle black, you know, sort of having a book saying, you know, you have this complex thing here's why it's much more complex than people say for uh, 80% of the book and then in the final chapter he turns around and does the same thing to this uh, complex system where he really um, sort of clearly hasn't done very much reading you know so this is not something uh, this is not a set of topics where he has uh, really embedded himself in the uh, discussions of the technicalities of how the global economy works and so he just says well it's all about military power and uh, that's that's that so I think we're reaching the end of what we can talk about in this topic. We're reaching there. We're not quite there without me having read your book. So I need I need to read your book. But let me throw something out, which is where I started this discussion on my series. And this comes up a bit. I just, as I told you, just reread some of the comments from your original post, which I'm probably more up on than you are. But it seems to me I'm having a hard time figuring out the difference between imperialism, military imperialism that backs finance and financial imperialism that is backed by the the military, which is a question that comes up in, in the comments on your blog post is, is there a difference between these? And let me try this out. It strikes me that the fundamental definition of liberalism, if you want to locate it in Locke and maybe also Hobbes, plenty of places, is this sort of thing like freedom depends on the ability to you know, do what you want to do. And that means you have to be able to have property. And that means there has to be violence protecting your property. And the two kind of come in, in the state of nature or the leap from the state of nature into whatever you want to say. I'm mixing Hobbes and Locke, but in ways that I think work, the violence and the freedom and the property those three are just intertwined in a way that it seems to me difficult to unpack. And so in the big mm -hmm. picture, you and Graeber and Hudson and me and Locke and Hobbes all agree, do we not? Or what is the what is the importance of this disagreement? So I think the importance is what do you want to target? You know, so what are the uh, so if you want to think about this in a practical sense, if you want to think about 
where does the uh, what you want to do to change, you have to have a clear account of where the power resides. And uh, so I think and this is me speaking not as a broad social theorist, you know, so I read social theory, um, sort of I, 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 I've occasionally committed very amateur versions of it, but nothing that I would want anybody to uh, take uh, at all seriously. Uh, if you read social theory, you can come up with broad accounts of where things come from. And these are very often mythologies. You know, so it's very, very clear. You know, if you look at Locke, you look at Hobbes, both mm -hmm. of these are providing you know, sort of, uh, di different versions of uh, a social contract, an original Ur contract, which Rousseau does the same thing in different yep. ways. But you know, so all of these are these accounts which suggest you know, so that there is a kind of almost a founding moment of our society. And this is one of the necessary fictions that they use in order to try and explain why we are in the world that we are today. And the part of that ne necessary fiction that is correct, and that I think we all agree on, is that coercion and property and power all um, sort of uh, exist together in some complex mm -hmm. bundle. But, and this is the important but, Good. Uh, Good. you want, to, if you want to actually change things, whether you want to do this from your point of view as an anarchist or my point of view as a, a wussy social democrat or whatever, <laughs> you want to have a very clear idea of what are the specific workings of power through which things happen so that if you take action A, you are likely to uh, be successful as opposed to action B, which misidentifies as of how the power relations work and hence ends up in a complete wrong space altogether. And so, that, so the basis of my disagreement with Graeber was not that power is unimportant. You know, so if uh, Graeber had this thing, as I recall from when I read it last year, more or less saying that Farrell, um, sort of he, he is saying you know, sort of that there's no such thing as American empire. And I said, that's absolute bullshit. I, I never said that. You know, so I think imperialism is a very useful thing. It's how imperialism works. If you think imperialism is a problem, you want to understand how it works. And so I think that that he had a crude toy version of imperialism in which everything depended upon military force. And you know, so he has these examples which he provides, more or less suggesting that the reasons why the United States turns against this or that country is because this or that country is moving away from the US dollar, uh, is moving away from the debt relations associated with the US dollar. So the US steps in to squash them. And uh, I just saw it, he was looking at the way in which the international economy works, that's impossible. That doesn't work that way. U.S. military power is quite substantial, but uh, the U.S. Uh, does not. Um, sort of, you know, if it tried to uh, use its military power to squash everybody who disagreed with it on economics, who didn't want to use the U.S. dollar, then we would be in a very, very different world than the world we're in today. We uh, and the U.S. would rapidly discover the limits to its ability to project force, which would make it just impossible to maintain the global system that is out there. And so this then turns to the obvious question. If it is not military power which is doing the work here, what are the forms of power that we can turn to? And uh, in my response to Graeber, I uh, sort of I more or less waved my hand saying, I don't think it's this. I don't, you know, so I, 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 I think we would have to look at um, sort of these more complicated economic and financial relations. And in some ways, the book that Abe Newman and I wrote, my parts of that are in some ways a effort to try and answer that question more specifically. And so what I argue argue with Abe in that book is that we really need to understand how the global economy has become intensely centralized, some sort of the global financial system, some aspects of production of semiconductors and other things, and where it is centralized in these kinds of ways, uh, so that there are these choke points in the global economy, and where the United States has control of these choke points, it is able to use this as a uh, system of power projection, which can have very, very substantial consequences. So that, for example, when Iran, uh, you know, the United States wants to push Iran to try and uh, get it to uh, stop its nuclear program, and it effectively is able to deny Iran access to the global financial system through its control of this uh, so-called dollar clearing system, through uh, its ability to work together with Europeans to control SWIFT, which is a financial messaging network that is essential to global finance. And so this turns out to be a very, very substantial form of power indeed. And so I guess my suggestion, and this is a suggestion to social democrats, to anarchists, to a whole bunch of other people. One of the stranger things has been seeing a bunch of conservatives taking up the <laughs> argument that Abe and I make, is if you want to understand this, you need to have a clear mapping of what the actual power relations are. And to the actual power relations, military power is a significant part of this. 
But uh, we are not back in the days of 19th century gunboat diplomacy, where if you repudiated your debts, you would find yourself with some um, sort of gunboats, some um, sort of shelling your capital. Instead, we are in a world where when Argentina, for example, uh, repudiates its debts, and there was a piece in the Financial Times this morning about this, uh, it finds itself being sued in US courts. And it finds that international financial institutions are able to pursue its assets, are able to, and, and uh, in which it has to effectively listen to U.S. courts, again, because of the dollar clearing system, because banks depend internationally on dollar clearing, and uh, financial institutions do. And if you are able to get the United States to uh, do stuff, then banks have to listen to what the United States is saying. And so this provides a very, very different set of channels of power and a very different understanding of the global economy than Graeber. I think our understanding of the global economy also has its limitations. I think that uh, if you look at the, we, we wrote the book a year ago, I think it turns out that some aspects of US power have turned out to be less overwhelming than perhaps we thought back then. It turns out that when you really go after, for example, Russia, there's lots and lots of stuff that Russia can do, for example, to uh, find ways to use the darker parts of the economy to pursue its goals and its aims without the US being able to do as much about it as, as you would like. But that is the kind of system that I think we need to turn to in order to understand how imperial power and how empire works in the 21st century. Sorry, that's very long, but the, but that's basically where the uh, fundamental disagreement, I think, lies. And also where, in a perverse way, I, I think I owe Graeber a debt, because uh, I probably would not have formulated my part of this uh, argument. Abe, of course, has his own uh, superhero or supervillain origin story. I, I probably would not, not have formulated my part of this if it hadn't been for Graeber getting pissed off at me, me getting pissed off at Graeber, and starting to think through, okay, if he is wrong on this, what exactly is it that holds the system together? That was great. Uh, I I would say m more or less I agree with you. It's it seems to me again, and and when I was talking about the founding myths of people like Locke and Hobbes, and and you added Rousseau, my point was not that those myths were true, although the violence and property part obviously is true. It sounds like we agree on that. But the people who are making the world as it is believe these myths to be true, that property must be protected ultimately by violence. And what this means is, and this is again where I started this series, the goal of the people who are trying to run the world, whatever you want to say now, I sound like a conspiracy theorist, is, is to sort of financialize everything. And they also think that behind that financialization must ultimately lie force, whether that's the police force domestically or a hegemonic military globally. But their stated view in the 21st century that it would be better if there were no gunboats and everything were done financially is a true view that they are acting on. But they also believe that surely one must pay your debts and the reason why there are men representing governments with guns all over the world is this moral claim that surely one must pay one's debts. But to focus on the men with guns in the U.S. global hegemony, if it is such a thing as we're thinking about it right now, as if they are sort of standing outside third world countries, pointing rocket launchers at them and saying, surely one must pay one's debts, has got it backwards. And you take Graeber to be making that point. And I haven't I haven't reread that final chapter. And it is the other way around. And that, uh, that sounds good to me, Henry. That sounds good. If you think about this as anarchy versus the state, or, uh, you've got to confront the fact that human beings can be assholes under any plausible economic and social formation that you can think about. Power is never something that you can get rid of. Uh, you know, so there are always going to be power relations and that these power relations are going to play out in different ways and in ways which make it somewhat difficult to moralize. So sometimes I am actually I'm sort of in favor of having um, some kind of centralized um, sort of power to make decisions. I think that we will be in a better world if, for example, it was possible to have some kind of, I, I'm trying to remember, somebody's 
book Climate Leviathan. You know, if you had some powerful <laughs> actor which was actually able to observe forth through, you've got to take action against climate change. You know, there, there are circumstances under which centralized power is a valuable and a useful thing to have. Equally, centralized power, once it arises, it doesn't just give people the opportunity to produce uh, general social goods. It gives people the opportunity to be assholes in all sorts of ways that we're familiar with and that don't just involve um, sort of military force. There's a great book by Nick Mulder, The Economic Weapon, which is about the origins of financial sanctions and really retraces the way in which financial sanctions emerged from weapons of war, which um, sometimes were used to create uh, situations of mass starvation in the early 20th century. So what I'm saying, I guess, is equally you can see how important parts of the global system of power inequality in some ways rely upon the kinds of social relations that diffuse um, sort of forms of cooperation between businesses, between banks, between these other actors in ways that um, sort of also shape and constrain states. So, uh, uh, for example, you look at the uh, ISDS system of investor state dispute resolution mechanisms, which um, sort of limit the power of governments to do this, that, and the other, and which really are policed by this informal set of fears that uh, if you deviate from this, you're going to get banks refusing to invest in your economy. So I guess sort of when it comes down to these kinds of things, one of the reasons why I resist the kind of arguments that Graeber made, and equally, I think why I am also skeptical that you can really create, you know, and maybe this gets back to what you're saying about, about how Graeber did not see this as a utopia. I think you can get to better worlds, but I think that getting to those better worlds, the processes are going to be messy and that identifying the one or the other social system as being the be-all and uh, end-all of um, sort of creating something that is fundamentally better is going to be highly problematic because you want to have different forces countervailing each other. And this is perhaps the wishy social democrat um, sort of coming out, uh, wishy-washy social democrat coming out in me. You need to have different so- social forces prevailing against each other and to some extent constraining each other as countervailing forces, as J.K. Galbraith said, to make sure that that there's some opportunity for liberty and for happiness and for people's ability to build community and the interstices between these vast monstrosities uh, that we live in. That probably went in a different direction, uh, but... I, sure, it, it, went in a, it went in a different direction. It's a good and productive direction. I could take this up for an, an hour. I just recorded an interview with James Galbraith, so that was fun as well. Uh, but I think I have to not take this up. I think I have to not take up everything you just said, Henry, except to say it was very interesting and I have and I have thoughts about it, but there's no there's no there's no time to take up that that level of social yeah. theorizing, I don't think. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And uh, I have more thoughts about AI and the way that AI is changing that, which, uh, but that's a whole different set of set of questions and a whole different set of topics. Oh, God, yeah. No, I started a whole podcast on AI, but I'll, I'll put that aside as well. So the thing that I want to make sure we end at is your utterly vicious compliment to David Graeber that he was uh, a, a great, what was it, creative nonfiction writer? Because I thought we could end there because I should say I... I agree with you again that Graeber was a great creative nonfiction writer. Although, again, in my uh, in my anarchist way, I don't really like this fucking distinction. One thing that comes up over and over again is like, oh, Graeber's ideas are really interesting, you know, but his book isn't really accurate. And my question is, whose books are really accurate? Are not all books just approximations? I mean, this this. When I say this, people accuse me of nihilism. So I guess this is your chance to accuse me of nihilism. What's the, what's the distinction to be a creative nonfiction writer versus a, a real tough, hard-boiled nonfiction writer? So I, th- I think that they are different forms of knowledge. And I'm sure you know, if Graeber were still alive and he had seen that comment I w- have made, I have no doubt that I would get um, sort of another 5,000 words of vituperation or um, sort of vicious uh, Twitter comments or whatever. He would have seen this as being a direct attack. But it was genuinely meant as, a, you know, sort of as an ambivalent compliment, but a real compliment, because I think that we need to have a social imagination. And uh, we need to have a 
bigger sense of what is possible than that which is provided by the bare bones of the historical record. There's some historian, I, I remember hearing this years ago, and I can't remember who, it's one of those comments, but some historian was described to me once as saying that fire and flood are a historian's two best friends. In other <laughs> words, that, uh, you know, so that you really can have much more opportunity to say things or to do things when you're not completely constrained by the empirical record. And I also think that I think that we're in a world where it's very, very clear that the record of what has been done to date doesn't provide us with sufficient guidance to the kinds of things that we want to and need to do in order to make a better future. So here, when I say creative, creative nonfiction, what I'm saying here is, you know, so Graeber, he clearly, he got furious. Uh, there was one other person at the same time who he got furious with about the notorious Apple having been founded by former Republican engineers in uh, sort of pods in uh, garages or whatever thing that he had in the first edition of Death, which turned out to be wrong. And uh, so he got furious, you know, sort of about how you know, everything was documented and this was something that had happened in the production process, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I know that the uh, volume with Wengrove has also gotten some negative reviews, I'm suggest suggesting that this, that, or the other thing doesn't reflect what is said in the in this or that source or whatever. I haven't read the book, uh, so I can't comment on the specifics of whether that is true or not. Or, you know, and I know that there always are bitter controversies that are fought over the uh, footnotes, uh, etc., etc., <laughs> etc. Et but I guess where I come down to in the end is that I think that's there should be room in scholarship for people to be more creative. I think this is one of the problems that we have, especially in the social sciences, is that we work in a mode of describing and f describing uh, is or, or, or explaining. And uh, explanation has become more and more and more in my part of the social sciences. It's been about proving causation, which is something that is incredibly difficult to do, except under extremely unlikely circumstances. And so this has created, I think, a somewhat intellectually arid approach, which really um, sort of confines itself just to what is provably so and provably true and whatever. I think that there is more scope for people to be, I think, creative and trying to expand our imagination and our understanding. I think this can be done by fiction writers. Somebody who I think, Dan Robinson, Ministry for the Future, is one of the books that has been most powerful over the last few years. And it is powerful because it is in this weird kind of interzone between fact and fiction. That is, Dan wrote it. It's a novel. You know, so it has imaginary characters. But the reason large chunks of the novel are taken up with proposals of one sort or another, and the reason why it is called Fire is not because it is a great novel. I think that Stan has written far, far better novels, qua novels in the past, the reason it's caught fire is because it is in that space between fact and imagination. So I think that Graeber, I think, again, if I, you know, especially coming from me, he would have um, sort of been furious. But I think that having more writing in that space between fact and imagination is something that not only I think is a good thing, I think it's an essential and an urgent thing. I would prefer that we were in a world where we didn't, how can I put it, that it will be possible for people to be creative as social scientists without them sort of having to make what appear to be strong factual arguments documented at the same time. Equally, I think that there should be a dialogue between more imaginative forms of social inquiry and facts, because you know, if you, you do want to have the flights of fancy to some degree in order to expand our sense of what is possible, equally, you want the flights of fancy to be attacked by engineers who point out that, um, sort of, in fact, um, sort of Icarus could never have stuck on those wings in the first place, and um, sort of, even without the wax melting when it got close to the sun, things would probably have not worked all that well. So I think you, you, we, we need a different kind of understanding of the social sciences, I'm somebody who tries to stick as much as I can to the fact-based stuff, at least when I talk about it myself as a social scientist, or when I'm an essayist or whatever, it's a different thing. And I, I, I would like to see more willingness by social scientists to acknowledge the value of the imagination and to acknowledge the value of things that expand our sense of possibilities without necessarily being nailed down in the ways that uh, social scientists try to nail things down. All right. I think that's very well put. 
I do not need to have a last word on this, so we will leave it at that. Uh, unless there's anything else you would like to add before we go, Henry. Well, I guess uh, my publisher will be very sad if I don't tell you to go out and buy the book. It's called <laughs> Underground Empire, How America Weaponized the World Economy. Abe Newman and I have written it, and it is a fun book, I think. So, uh, so let me just put in that plug uh, for what that is worth. All right. Well, hopefully one of these days there can be an Everyday Anarchism episode about that book. Maybe we can get your co-author. Uh, if we can if we can find the time, there's always there's there's always the time crunch. Um, but Henry, thank you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy book promoting schedule to talk David Graver. And I'm glad you got a chance to do a little book promoting along the way. Thank you so much. This was a fun conversation. Mm-hmm.